Hello, everyone. My name is Erin Rutherford, and I am the Collection Development Librarian here in the E.P. Taylor Library and Archives at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Thank you for joining me today to take a closer look at a book cover design by Alice C. Morris. I'm speaking to you in virtual space, but here where I sit and the land on which the AGO operates is Mishi Sagik Nishinaabe territory. It is governed by a treaty between the Mississauga of the Credit and the Canadian government, and has also been occupied by other Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat confederacies. Many First Nations have met in Toronto over time. I am grateful to have the opportunity to live and to work on this land. Until the early 19th century, most book bindings from the humble to the opulent were made by hand. Those purchasing printed works would have commissioned book binders to create unique bindings for any given book or budget. But increased demand for reading materials among the middle class at this time necessitated economy and speed in book production. Cloth was introduced as a binding material and casing where boards were covered before being adjoined with a text block as opposed to afterward became the common binding process. Advances in mechanical production, decoration, and the labeling of cloth bindings made it possible for the printing industry to produce books more quickly. The result of these developments is what we now refer to as publisher's bindings, or bindings designed and manufactured in quantity for a publisher. To catch the eye of the reading public, publishers invested in colorful dynamic designs for covers, like the one that you see here, that alluded to the stories within. The mass produced books that these covers enveloped were relatively affordable and became immensely popular. As art and design were among the few occupations open to women at this time, this boom in a major facet of the decorative arts opened new educational and professional opportunities for women artists. One such artist who became a prominent designer of covers for commercial books was Alice Cordelia Morse. Morse's career exemplifies, as Mindel Dubansky writes, the rapidly changing role of women in culture and art in the late 19th century. Alice Cordelia Morse was born in Ohio in 1863 and raised in Brooklyn. She studied art and design at the Women's Art School of the Cooper Union, specializing in drawing. She continued her schooling at Alfred College and then studied stained glass work for a year with John Lafarge. In 1885, Morse took a position in the women's glass studio at the firm of Lewis C. Tiffany, painting and designing at least 78 windows during her time there. Following receipt of her first commissions for book cover designs by 1887, Morse left Tiffany to return to Cooper Union for postgraduate courses and to pursue work as an independent designer. From 1887 to 1905, she created no fewer than 83 covers for New York City's preeminent publishers. As new and less expensive printing technologies were developed, demand for design work lessened and Morse pursued a career in education. Following her graduation from a teacher education course at Pratt Institute in 1897, she moved to Scranton, Pennsylvania and took up a position as supervisor of art and drawing in the city's public school system. During her time in Pennsylvania, she was promoted twice before retiring in September of 1923 and moving back to New York City that same year. Interestingly, despite her success, the attribution of Morse's work to her hand was almost lost to the passage of time. 
you see Morse took a different approach than some of her notable competitors, whose characteristic styles and color palettes often remained the same across their book and cover designs. Morse tailored and adapted her work to complement the theme of each title. Perhaps it was this versatility, this lack of a continuous style that led to her almost being forgotten. So how was her work ultimately rediscovered? In 1997, a librarian at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City named Mindel Dubansky discovered a print box in a storage room. That box contained an uncatalogued collection of 58 covers, which she learned had been gifted to the library in 1923, that same year you'll remember when Morse had moved to the city. It was transferred to the Department of Drawings and Prints in 1956. Calligraphic labels in the box read, quote, designed and presented by Alice C. Morse. Dubansky went on to write the definitive book on Morse, present an exhibition of her book covers and establish scholarship on the artist. Morse's covers span many genres from landscape gardening to literature. Her aesthetic is tidy and elegant, reserved yet rich. The AGO Library holds six examples by her hand. And this brings us, of course, to the focus of our study today, a lovable crank by then popular writer of Juvenalia, Barbara Yachton. The covers on this playful title were designed, as you may have guessed, by Morse. Here is an image of our copy's title page showing that the book was published by Dodd, Mead and Company in 1898. And as a point of interest, here we can see the title listed as one of the company's newly released offerings from their autumn of 1898 catalog. On to the design. Our copy is bound in light brown coarse weave cloth. The upper cover has a jotted line border stamped in green. In the center is a symmetrical floral design in the Art Nouveau style, made up of red orange trumpet vine flowers and green stems surrounding the title and author's name stamped in gold. The design is signed with conjoined initials as you can see in the detail here, A, M, for Alice Morse, a quarter of the way down the central stem. The book's spine has a similar flower design with the title and author's name stamped in gold. The illustrator of the title named Minna Brown was actually Morse's classmate at Cooper Union eight years earlier in fact, we can see from the school's annual report that in 1890, Morse won the silver medal for life drawing and Brown was one of three bronze medal winners in that same category. Let's now take a look at a few of the examples of Brown's illustrations from within the book. The illustrations either occupy a full page, as you see here, or are interspersed in line with the text. Each is captioned with lines directly pulled from Yechton's writing. Sometimes we find treasures in books beyond their printed components. On the front end papers of our title, we find an inscription in pencil. In swooping cursive handwriting, it reads number 19. Bessie W. Grant, 102 Melrose Street, Providence, Rhode Island. Hoping to learn more about the history of ownership or provenance of this book, I launched into my research. Digging through United States census and state records, I believe I was able to pinpoint the individual who likely wrote these words. Bessie West Grant was born on October 20th 1883 at 50 Davy Street in Providence, Rhode Island to George Henry Grant and Ella Frances Burdick. Her father was a traveling agent, president of an electric and protective co, as well as a politician. 
on August 3rd, 1910, at the age of 27, Bessie married one Walter Gilbert Kenyon, who was a dentist. Although unable to trace the full details, I learned that Bessie passed away only five years later on April 23rd, 1915 in Michigan. She is buried in the North Burial Ground in Providence, Rhode Island. If Bessie acquired her copy, now the EGO's copy of A Lovable Crank, when it was first published, she would have been 15 years old at the time. The first line of her inscription, number 19, indicates to me that the title was among many of a book collection treasured by Bessie. It was just one of many. We can picture her reading the title in the diffuse light of a leaded glass window and can actually speculate as to which window, knowing that the dwelling presently standing at 102 Melrose Street in Providence is in fact the one in which Bessie lived. And here is that house as shown by a Google Street View in 2019. The house was designed and built by architect Frederick E. Field and is considered by the Providence Preservation Society to be one of the most exuberant Queen Anne colonial revival houses in the city. Field purchased the property, then an empty lot in 1890. Tax records from the following year indicate a new building valued at 7,500 US dollars standing on the property. Deed books then show that Field sold the property to one George H. Grant, Bessie's father, in 1896. Records show that although the house changed hands a few times in subsequent years, Bessie's mother, Ella, held interest in it until she passed away in 1952. The AGO's copy of A Lovable Crank offers up myriad stories, those of the women who produced the title and those of the woman who called it her own. After our close looking, we can truly say that Alice Cordelia Morse's decorative design with its curving shapes and natural forms is at surface level aesthetically pleasing. But as we push the narrative further, we realize that as Dubansky asserts, Morse excelled as an artist at a time when art and design were male dominated industries. I can't help but wonder if this title authored by a woman, illustrated by a woman and with covers designed by a woman artist provided a form of inspiration to the young Bessie Grant. It certainly does to me and I hope that you have enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much for joining me today. Stay happy and stay safe.